I think everyone who's read Berserk can agree on one thing. Berserk resonates, which is a weird thing to say. In paper, a story about a hyper-masculine, muscular, edgy dude who carries a chunk of iron, apparently called a sword, fighting through hordes of enemies that range from other dudes in armor to gargoyles, snake men, the Taurus demon, and literal gods should not be relatable to humans in the 21st century. If that is the case, wouldn't it even be a little bit sad? But it does. And what's even more weird when you look at it on paper is that this same guy whose first appearance in the story he is the main character of is him, um, getting maidens only for the maiden to turn into a monster and him killing it with his arm cannon with a little grin on his face uh and yes with his other cannon still you know Oh, you little lovely goofball. Kintaro Miura crafted a story that would strip humanity to its very core so that it's ugly, terrifying, goofy, endearing, but sometimes worthwhile essence would be naked for us to see. I love Berserk, and I think most people who read it, if not end up loving it, will make emotional bonds with it unlike anything they have ever consumed before. But Let's be honest, me telling you how great Berserk is is like peeing in a public pool. I'm hardly adding any of my own substance into this piss filled hole. But I want this video to be more than just that. I want to take a closer look at Berserk with the lens of absurdism and some other media that I've come to love that I think will enrich our discussion of Berserk's theme and message on life. But more specifically, modern life. Berserk's world is one that is dark, terrifying, and vast. The people who occupy the lands are those ridden with disease, destitution, and slavery. Except of course for those up inside the giant castles. The kings and the royalty spend their time in leisure. The lands can be seen to be soaked in blood and bodies as war has become a part of life. We are introduced to our main character as a dark and violent figure trying to get into the castle to possibly murder the king. The Black Swordsman arc does two things so to speak. One, it introduces us to Guts, Puck, and the rotting world full of monsters that I described earlier. But the second thing it does is that it sets the foundation of Guts' backstory into our minds. This is what I mean, as he fights off the king, these Guys appear, literal gods, the god hand, out of whom Guts seems to have a particular hatred for Femto, who as we learn later into the story is Griffith's persona. Having Guts, a stoic masculine man who up until now has only shown emotions of varying annoyance, smirks, and some rough witty remarks about his opponents that he continues to obliterate, Guts breaks into a monstrous rage upon seeing Griffith. This builds an expectation in our minds, as the following chunk of the story of over 80 chapters are basically flashbacks to what had happened that would justify such a reaction from Guts. And so the reader has already seen the predetermined endpoint. So essentially Mira shows us an image of a destroyed car and then proceeds to show us the journey that car took from the very beginning that we know will lead up to it being destroyed. Guts was born to a corpse of a mother. Guts is a boy who grew up into war. Without proper love or care, the only person he looked up to and admired ultimately hated him and sold him off. His character is one that's filled with such pathos and tragedy that you just have to empathize with him no matter who you are. Then you see him actually find people to care for and build connections with, and you yourself will begin to love these people along with Guts. But looming over all of it is the image of the destroyed car, as you realize that these people were the ones who were in that car all along. 
This builds an air of melancholy, as you know that this golden age will come to an end very soon. An end that would destroy the band of the hawks and result in this broken, emotionless beast of a guts and this menacing, inhumane femto. But then Mura twists your goddamn nipples because you automatically expected the car to get into a car crash. What you didn't expect is a goddamn nuclear bomb dropping on it. The Eclipse is the pivotal event in the story and basically split our main character into guts before and guts after the Eclipse. What you see in the Eclipse is a man losing any sort of semblance of understanding he had over his life and the world. A man who had no reason to trust anyone in his life to begin with, but then actually continues to receive and give love to a little group of mercenaries, but especially to Griffith. And this Griffith straight up gave him up and everyone he loved in order to fulfill his own ambition. Up until now, it was Guts swinging his sword to get through dudes in armors, which he was quite good at. And now that was simply not enough. The Eclipse basically resets, hell, puts him even further back in his journey to finding meaning in life and finding people to care for. It is heart-wrenching to watch Guts struggle breathlessly to try and save at least one person and failing miserably to do so. And after the Eclipse is when Berserk's real story really begins. A story of a man cursed by literal gods to struggle over and over and over again. A man destined to die. Die without finding any sort of purpose or meaning. Without any love or care. As everywhere he goes he invites danger, making it hard for him to live, let alone love. What's up everybody, it's Critical. I'm playing Dark Souls, and I'm playing on the first character I created on this game, and this character is fuck. I don't think I will surprise anyone if I say that Dark Souls is the berserk of gaming. Hidetaka Miyazaki himself has stated that he took heavy inspirations from Berserk, specifically its art, themes, and world for both Demon Souls and Dark Souls. Dark Souls is truly one of my favorite things ever. Not only because I really really like sword stuff and also big monsters, but also because of its atmosphere. Dark Souls builds an atmosphere of loneliness and isolation and despair through its dying and decaying world not unlike that of Berserk's. And also like Berserk's world, we are made aware very early on that we know nothing about this world and reality. You know you are an undead, that is you cannot die but only go hollow, that is lose your mind. And you know you need to ring the two bells of awakening because your savior told you to, Oscar. The man who dropped your cell keys into your cell so that you could escape the undead asylum assisted after ringing the bells of awakening, quote, the fate of the undead thou shalt know. And yet after ringing the bells there isn't really any new information that you are granted with. Sense Fortress opens up, that's it. The world is deceptive, even the new knowledge you are presented with is, in most cases, false. There are mimics that, other than a few telltale signs, perfectly mimic real chests that could kill you in just one grab. There are illusory walls. There are illusory boobs. The glorious golden sunshine of Anor Londo is an illusion. Hell, even one of the bosses you fight isn't real. In the infamous Ornstein and Smo fight, you aren't really fighting the real Dragon Slayer Ornstein. This is pointed out by how you encounter old Dragon Slayer Ornstein in Dark Souls 2 and find his armor in Dark Souls 3. Another example of this happening is the story of Artorias. You are led to believe in a story of a glorious hero by the name of Artorias. But then when playing the DLC, you realize that Artorias' tales of valor aren't really true as it is not Artorias but you who saves Princess Dusk from Manus. Nothing you are presented with is like how it is. Darkstalker Koth says that Frampt is manipulating you so that you would defeat Gwyn and once again postpone the fading of the flame. 
Framed and Gwendolyn want to use you up as fuel to extend their Age of Fire, that is, the Age of the Gods. But on the other hand, Koth says that the Age of Dark is the natural course of the world and Gwyn is just a cowardly old man trying to keep his age living on whilst it is the Dark Age that is your or humanity's age that should naturally come forth. However, Koth cannot be trusted either as we go and see the effects of what the Dark does to people when we go to the town of Ulaseel in the DLC portion of the game. Hence they're both sort of manipulating you and you really don't know what ending to choose. Hell, even the ending you choose doesn't really matter because either way, Dark Souls 3 also exists in the same world so whatever you do, it doesn't matter. Humans in Dark Souls are the descendants of the Furtive Pygmy, who is the one who took the Dark Soul as detailed in the opening cinematic. As the Age of Fire or the Age of the Gods is coming to an end, Gwyn, the King of the Lords, curses humans, the inheritors of the Dark Soul, with the curse of the undead. Like Guts, the undead you play as in Dark Souls is a being who's been punished by literal gods to a destined end, which for the undead is going hollow or losing one's mind. We see this happening with many of the NPCs in the game. They all eventually lose their purpose in life and go hollow and attack us, prompting us to put them out of their misery. Like Guts, humanity is cursed to live with a thirst for meaning and love. A thirst that can never be satisfied. The Coen Brothers 2013 film Inside Lewin Davis is one of my favorite films ever made. It's about the journey of a struggling folk musician, the titular Lewin Davis, detailing a part of his life as a homeless artist, living off of paycheck to paycheck, crashing in couch to couch, struggling to sell his album to records after the suicide of his performing partner by the name of Mike. The film is not a pretty one. Even the most colorful places the film takes you are washed out and muted. Hell, Lewin is not a charismatic guy at all. Danny. Your uncle's a bad man. Okay. He's rude to most people around him. He's quite petty and self-pitying. And yet still, Oscar Isaac plays him with a rather endearing vibe. You still root for him even if he's an asshole to everyone around him. After the death of Lewin's partner Mike, his career has been on decline. But then again, Mike's very suicide tells us that their career never was that huge to begin with. His career in folk music is a dying and decaying one. He hasn't really gotten over the death of his partner. He got his friend's wife pregnant and while visiting a doctor for the purposes of arranging an abortion for her, he finds out that he may have a child that he never knew about when a similar thing happened with a different woman a couple of years ago. Because everything you touch turns to shit! He loses the cat of the people who let him crash at their place and later brings home a different cat which wasn't even male like the original one was. Where's his scrotum? He has a real distaste for people like his aforementioned friends, Jim and Jean, and also his sister who've all secured themselves a middle class house and job unlike Lewin himself. He refers to his father, a man who's possibly spent his whole life laboring as a mariner as merely existing. I describe all this because, as I said, this is not a pretty movie. There is an uncomfortable realism in this film, one that refuses to leave even when we really hope it finally takes off its claws from this film. Lewin does not get to sell his album to a record label. The movie ends the same way the movie began, with Lewin in a dark alleyway beat up by an unknown aggressor due to him having yelled at an old woman performing. You can probably see why Dark Souls, Berserk, and Inside Lewin Davis are all clumped together in this video. They all follow a main character struggling through life in order to reach a certain goal, as if cursed by the gods to struggle till eternity, which they are in the case of Berserk and Dark Souls, until they either give up and die or go hollow or reach their goal which was meaningless all along. Second, no, damn it. It's a fucking back alley beatdown. Look at that. I just found my way into the depths and the welcoming committee takes a nice liquid piss on me. This reminds me of a rather famous Greek legend. 
that off, Sisyphus. Those who are aware of it probably saw this coming a mile away, but I'll explain nonetheless. Sisyphus was a king who Zeus kinda hated. So Zeus ordered Thanatos, the god of death, to, well, death Sisyphus. But Sisyphus tricks Thanatos and escapes death. Zeus is made even more furious by it, so he tries to get Sisyphus killed again. Sisyphus then again tricks the gods and escapes death. Zeus, sick of all this, once and for all, punishes Sisyphus into rolling a huge boulder up a hill, only when he nears the top of the hill, the boulder rolls back down, and Sisyphus is to do this over and over and over again to all of eternity. The myth of Sisyphus is a rather peculiar work to examine because in recent years we seem to relate to it even more than when it was initially conceived. You watching this video are either working or a student. In either case, you probably have felt the tedium of doing something you find soul-sucking and redundant. Whether it be paperwork, mashing away at your keyboard, physical labor, or simply jotting down notes that the teacher has compiled to get you enough grades to get you into the real world, never mind the actual core of the idea that's being taught. Get the grades and get out so that you can join the workforce whose lives feel worthless and pointless as they work away their lives never earning real wages they deserve. This is modern existence. At least for the lower to middle class. Which, if you're born into it, 99% of the time you cannot escape. Back in the good old days of the stone, things were simple. We would eat, sleep, and reproduce. That's all there was to life. But of course, as human intelligence grew and we began to reason, we sort of started to make up reasons for why things happened and why things were the way they were. Were these reasons factual? Not really, but nonetheless it made us feel free and in control. Surely this is all for me. Me, 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 I, I. I'm, I'm so fucking important. I'm so fucking important, right? Fuck you. The scientific revolution of the 16th century brought forth an age of science. What science did was disprove all the commonly held religious beliefs about the world and reality and abolish a system of society of baseless traditional doctrines. It introduced the scientific method, a method of observing, measuring, experimenting, hypothesizing, and testing over and over again. However, science did something that we did not expect it to do. That being, it disproved most commonly held religious beliefs, morals, and traditions. It effectively showed us the complexities that existed in reality that we were otherwise oblivious to. However, it did not really explain those complexities. In other words, it showed us what we didn't know, but did not really give us that knowledge itself. We still don't really know anything. Sure, we have made incredible advances in, in technology and biology and physics, but then again, science itself requires a bit of faith. It isn't something that can 100% show us the truth. The Big Bang Theory at the end of the day is a theory. The string theory is a hypothesis, nevertheless how well it explains anything. We cannot just know. And to add on to that, the world we live in is slowly suffocating us both figuratively and literally. Politics has become just another appeal to tribalism in order to keep us even more separated so that we don't actually come together and do something about our dying world. You, the individual, are trapped in the same cycle day by day in order to afford food. Everything sucks. We are afraid to realize that we don't know anything and that our actions are meaningless. So we ignore this fact and live in isolated bubbles and distract ourselves with meaningless grind sets that 90% of the time amount to nothing. If we can't know with science, what about philosophy? Well, there are two questions are more often asked than answered. Do humans possess a soul or are we just physical entities? What is the mind? Is there a world of ideas compared to the physical world where we exist? 
hell, what economic system do we adopt and how do we adopt it without ending up destroying the world? Is religion good or bad? Is, is human nature inherently good or bad? And finally, the question to end all be all, what is the meaning of life? This question is one that I've grown sick of. It seems that every other film, anime, or book that comes out is about this good old question. It's been discussed to Helen back and has given birth to many different schools of thought, and yet still we have no fucking clue. We have failed to put our foot down on a singular answer to this, and it seems that we ourselves are aware of this question's tedium, and yet still we can't help but ask it. What is the meaning of life? I am absolutely not the first to think this, but I think that the existence of this question speaks more about the human condition and our living systems than anything profound. Why do we ask this question anyways? Ulysses is a poem by Alfred Tennyson. Based on a poet friend of his, it's about Ulysses, or by his more known name, Odysseus the hero of the world-renowned ancient epic, Homer's Odyssey. This poem, however, is not about the triumphant king, Ulysses, but a rather somber lamentation by an aged Ulysses, one who has gotten sick of stagnation in his life. His heart yearns for one more sail with his mariners to a world not yet discovered. He feels stuck in his home with his old wife, he wants to get out for one more trip. In fact, he wants to sail till the day he dies. I bring this poem up, firstly, because Ulysses is the name of the cat that Lewin loses that belonged to the people whose house he was staying at. Secondly, because Lewin Davis, and by extension of this video, the undead from Dark Souls, Guts, and human beings themselves are a sort of Ulysses. By the end of his journey, Lewin tries to quit and pick up fishing like his father after being rejected by a music publisher. But Lewin can't, at first because quitting itself requires money that he doesn't have. But later, because Lewin just can't. This is his life. This is who he is. This is what he loves. Lewin, like Ulysses, is tired. I'm so fucking tired. I thought I just needed a night's sleep, but it's, it's more than that. Like the song he sings in the beginning and the end of the movie, he's tired, but yet still something inside him, like Ulysses, just cannot let him succumb to his fate of normalcy and eventual death. In the film, what's easy to miss the first time watching, as pointed out by a WordPress article I will link in the description down below, the people who Lewin meets along in his journey, the normal people who at first we understand to be the mature people who don't chase a supposed heat haze like Lewin and have settled down with a middle class career aren't really as reputable as they seem. For starters, one of Lewin's good friends, Jean, whom he got pregnant, seems to have a habit of indulging in affairs whilst her partner, Jim, seems to have written songs that pander to the record labels instead of anything original. Which, by the way, no matter what Lewin thinks of it, is still a banger and I don't want anyone saying anything about it. Lewin's partner, Mike, chooses the ultimate form of escapism, that being uh, self-death, in order to escape the painful cycle of their careers that just won't take off. The Gorefines who let Lewin stay at their apartment who are reputed people seem to show off Lewin as their exotic friend from the village to seem hip and not grey in front of their friends. The jazz man Roland Turner, played by the ever so charming John Goodman, seems to have a habit of using drugs, presumably heroin, to keep up with his uneventful life. Even his father, who has spent his whole life working in the sales, cannot even enjoy good music sung by his own son and is turned into a lifeless husk, who we only see move after soiling himself. Everyone of Lewin's normal friends 
try to escape their lives to find some excitement or try to fake their engagement with their lives. But on the other hand, we have Lewin. The second time the aforementioned aggressor beats him up, something different happens. Lewin crawls towards the path that his aggressor leaves through and sees him leaving in a cab. And then he says, Au revoir. With a pinch of humor and irony in his face. He isn't taking this seriously. This moment is one of the most empowering moments in all of cinema for me. This is a man who has gone through hell and back having achieved nothing, now realizing that he will have to make this journey again and possibly over and over again, mocking himself and his situation as if he is actually fine with it. He is okay with his absurd, meaningless existence. He doesn't care if he'll really never end up as a big name in the industry. He doesn't care if he doesn't have good money. Au revoir. Until I see you again, he finally understands what he is and he accepts it. Let me be clear once again, acceptance does not equal giving up. Giving up would be what Mike does. That is not what Lewin does. The phrase, don't you dare go hollow from Dark Souls resonates with people. Dark Souls saved me is a popular sentiment among the community. I think this is because the very nature of Dark Souls. It tells you that no matter how hard a boss may be, how difficult or frustrating their movesets may be, you can get through it. That just because you died once, hell, just because you died tens, even hundreds of times, you can get through this. Just like how Lewin treats his aggressor, you need to treat every death, every reset as the same. You need to accept the absurdity of it and try to find some fun in it. The same goes with Berserk. Even among the absolute pain-inducing struggle of Guts, Miura gives us these panels of Guts just sitting under the enormous, sublime, and humiliating sky. Or, or this, of Guts and his newfound family happily walking along a beach. Although, yeah, we know he'll suffer more and more, we know that he won't stop trying. We know he'll always get back up again and keep rolling his boulder. Like how Ulysses is hardwired to seek excitement and adventure, we humans are hardwired to seek reason. It is in our nature to ask for meaning. This is not only evident in how our religion seems to give us some false sense of self-importance, but also how the question, what is the meaning of life, keeps reoccurring over and over again in our culture and media. Like in Dark Souls, it's as if we are cursed by the gods to search for meaning in a totally meaningless world. It is very much like Sisyphus rolling a boulder up a hill only for it to fall back down again. We are stuck in an infinite loop of asking for meaning and not receiving any answer only for us to ask it again and so on. As I detailed in my other video on loneliness, Albert Camus, a French philosopher who wrote the classic essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, where he uses the titular myth of Sisyphus to point out our absurd existence as beings who inherently desire meaning in a cold and indifferent world, once said this famous phrase, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. For if Sisyphus is happy doing what was intended as eternal punishment by Zeus, then Sisyphus has won. He, a mere mortal, has won over gods. Such an existence of accepting absurdity is a revolutionary one. The undead, continuing in their journey in spite of the meaninglessness, is a rebellion against the gods who intended them to succumb to the meaninglessness and lose their minds. And you, continuing to play Dark Souls as the undead, is the rebellion against the very game that wants you to quit halfway through. Lewin, continuing his journey as an artist, even if he never makes it big in the industry, is a revolutionary, towards his existence as a being who naturally desires meaning in a meaningless world. Guts, being happy, 
with a new family even after his last one was massacred and ended up with him and Casca being branded that is destined to die. Keeping on living and being happy is a revolt against Griffith. I think that's where the manga is going. The ultimate form of revenge Guts can have against Griffith, a literal god who condemned him to a life of death, struggle, and pain is to live a life happy with the people he loves. It's comforting to know that Guts will fight on. It's comforting knowing that Lewin will keep struggling. We must imagine Sisyphus, Guts, Lewin, and the undead happy. Because if they are, then they have won against the gods that have put them there. And if they are, they have won against the uncaring, indifferent universe they belong to. And if you are, then you have won. Or you could have spent all this time watching Everything Ever All at Once, a modern masterpiece of a film and an examination of everything I said here but with cool kung fu fights and googly eyes instead of my dumb voice reading off a script. <sighs> Fuck. Thanks a lot for watching. This one took a while. Um, I think I say that every video. <laughs> Either way, follow my Twitter and subscribe to the channel and like the video and comment and uh, well, drink some water. Because, well, I'm- I'm thirsty. Thanks again for watching. I hope you stick around, um, for a while. Um, yeah. With that said, au revoir, strugglers.